okay, so we know from you know pre uh, 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 crystal is defined as two parts, the periodic lattice and the atomic basis. So as I've drawn before, you can have a unit cell bump, 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 like that. And that unit cell is defined by a set of lattice vectors and the atomic basis that's found at it. And in this case, I'm using uh, a set of vectors uh, R1 and R2 to specify the positions of the atoms relative to the origin of my uh, unit cell. And you know, there's always flexibility in where you choose the origin. Uh, I just happen to put it there. Most of the time, it's convenient to put the origin at the uh, one of the atoms, but uh, I just chose to not do that for this particular picture. Okay, so the grid of the lattice is defined by our set of vectors A, and the atoms, in this case I put two atoms, are defined by our set of lattice vector or atomic position vectors R. These lattices can be broken up. They're into subsets. There are a total of 14 lattices. And then by pairing the lattice vectors and atomic positions, you get different symmetry properties, which will define your crystal classes. For example, your rock salt crystal, your vertsite crystal, diamond cubic, et cetera. And we know that those can then be related to space groups. And we, we talked about those, I guess it was a last week or a week and a half ago. Okay, and the way that we characterize crystals and study them is through diffraction techniques. And these are all viable, x-ray, electron, and neutron, but I do want to point out something special here, that x-ray is still the only way to define a phase. So if you go to the you know, international body on uh, crystal crystals and crystallography, and you say, look, I've, I've discovered a, a new crystal. They will not accept electron diffraction data. They will only accept X-ray. So uh, be aware that, that even though electron diffraction has come a long ways, uh, X-ray is, is still really the most important. Well, that's not right. Let's, let's call it the uh, official standard bearer, maybe is a better way of putting it. Okay, and this is our Bragg's law, right? And we saw the derivation of that last time, right? I, I basically said, okay, so we've got, we got waves coming in, and then we have lines of atoms, we have uh, elastic scattering, meaning that as the waves are coming out of uh, these atoms are coming out in, in a way that they are phase related to each other and they also keep the same energy. And that allows us to talk about whether or not they constructively uh, interact or non-constructively interact. And I think that's a better way of putting it than destructive because anything that's not constructive is destructive. So any small shift in their phase position, like if I shift it just, just slightly here, any small shift is enough to lead to the loss of diffraction. And we set up a little derivation and we got our Bragg's law n lambda equals 2d sine theta, where d is the lattice spacing. It depends on the HKL plane you're looking at. Uh, theta is this incoming angle. Uh, lambda is the wavelength. And uh, n is an integer, uh, talking about the integer number of wavelengths. And typically, n is equal to 1. Okay, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to take this and I'd like to give you the mathematical background to talk about lattices. So if we talk about a crystal, we can talk about translation in that crystal using a translation vector. And that translation vector, which we're gonna use T, is just an integer 
sum of lattice vectors, right? So going back up here, we could talk about having some, uh, you know, lattice vector that goes from here to say here. And as long as the tail and the tip both end in the same relative position in the unit cell, that would be a translation vector. So this one would be t is equal to 1, 2, 3, 3, a1 plus 2, a2 plus 0, a3. So presumably there's a three dimensions to this crystal. OK, so that's our translation vector. Uh, these u's have to be integers, because if they're not integers, you don't wind up in the same position in the lattice. Now, what's in the lattice? Well, atoms are. But more importantly, and this is important for people in, in, in quantum, it's important for people talking about diffraction, uh, we have electrons that occupy this lattice, right? So you can imagine, you know, some lattice and it's got some electron density. So maybe, uh, maybe there's more electrons here and fewer here and more here and fewer here, right? And those are centered around the atoms or something. It doesn't have to be electrons, but because we're going to be talking about diffraction, we'll call them electrons. It can be any function. So any function. And that function, some position in a unit cell. So if I've got a unit cell here, and I have a vector in that unit cell, R, that's equivalent to R plus T. So here's R plus T, where in this case, T is equal to uh, 2A1 plus 2A2. Right, we're basically just saying that all the points in the unit cell that fall on top of each other are the same. OK. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this three-dimensional vector, and I'm going to turn it into a one-dimensional crystal. Because you'll see, once you can see how it works in one dimension, you'll see how it generalizes. So now, instead of having uh, x, y, and z, we'll just have x. And our function of r is now just going to become a function of x. And what I want to show you is that it's convenient to write out our function of x in our unit cell. So this is our, whoops, this is our unit cell. As a Fourier expansion. So this is what a Fourier expansion looks like. You have a you know, n0 coefficient, and then you have a sum uh, over some value. We're picking p as our subscript for all p greater than 0. So this goes to infinity. Turns out you don't really need to go to infinity for pra in, in practical terms. In, in uh, the most mathematical terms, yes, you need to go to infinity. But when you're actually applying this problem, you'll find that you can truncate that at a large enough number. So you keep adding and making your sum larger and larger and larger until you have what you need. And in this sum, we have a cosine term and a sine term. This CP and SP are just uh, coefficients. And they sit in front of a p, uh, a cosine and a sine. And in this particular expression, they are uh, real valued. They don't have to be. But uh, again, this is a one-dimensional example. So 
this uh, this type of expansion naturally enforces the crystal periodicity. And, and by that, I mean that if I take my function n and move it down here, and I substitute in for x, x plus a, then that means I put x plus a in here and in here. And that means that I can, uh, so here's my uh, sine and cosine term. So I can expand this out. And when I do that, I get 2 pi p over a x plus 2 pi p a over a. And because sine of x plus 2 pi p, where p is an integer, is just equal to sine x, and the same for cosine, that means that this becomes this, which is just our original expression. So n x plus a is equal to n x. So a, remember, is our lattice parameter here, right? We chose our unit cell to be defined by a. So the, the Fourier expansion is just a really natural way of forcing the periodicity that our crystal has. And that means that any function we have, charge density, atomic positions, whatever, we can write it out as a Fourier expansion and we'll force it to behave the way it should. Okay, so what I want you to see here is there's something special about this Fourier expansion. And, and what's special about it is this, 2 pi p over a, right? Because if we didn't have that 2 pi p over a, then we wouldn't have this 2 pi p a over a, right? So this is what makes it work. And this 2 pi p over a is called the reciprocal lattice. So I can draw out my real lattice. This is a real lattice. And corresponding to that, I can have my reciprocal lattice. And that reciprocal lattice are 2 pi 1 over a, 2 pi 2 over a, 2 pi 3 over a, right? 2 pi p over a, p equals, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. Well, I should say dot, 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 minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, dot, dot, dot. So it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Because, of course, we have this summation. OK. And what I also want to do now is I want to introduce to you a uh, shortcut or a, a, a nomenclature here that allows you to relate your sine and cosines to exponentials. And let me write this. Uh, let me see if I can add a add a uh, page to this somehow. You know what, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to write it right here. I'm going to write sine of x is equal to e to the i x minus e to the minus i x over 2 cosine x is equal to e to the i x plus e to the minus i x over 2. So if you substitute this in here, you will come out with this exponential relationship. And it's worth pointing out that if you combine these two together, you'll also get e to the i x is equal to cosine x plus i sine x. So that's 
crazy handy. Something else which is extremely useful is the hyperbolic cosine of x is equal to e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2. The hyperbolic sine of x is e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2. And that means e to the x is equal to hyperbolic cosine of x plus the hyperbolic sine of x. And I've, I've mentioned this to you before. Those of you that may someday see yourself doing math, go get a CRC uh, mathematics table. They're cheap, like two bucks. They're about an inch thick. And don't get ele electronically. Get a paper copy because you can hold it in your hand, you flip through it, and everything you ever need mathematically is there. There's like a whole page of these relationships. Uh, it's just crazy useful. So do consider uh, picking those up. So using these trigonometric relationships, that'll, that allows us to write our Fourier expansion in this compact form, now with an exponential. These are still our points on our reciprocal lattice. And of course, this changes a little bit now because NP is now a complex number. And you say, well, what, what do you mean it's complex? If, if this is real, why is this complex? It's complex because you're taking this sum from minus infinity to plus infinity. And as it so happens that the n sub minus p is equal to n p star. So if I have a plus b i is my complex number, if I take the star of that, that is a minus b i. So uh, and here I've worked through a little proof. I'm not going to show you the proof, but what you'll see when you step through it is that basically the only way that this proof holds is for this to be true. OK, so let's uh, skip down here. Now that we've got our uh, compressed Fourier expansion, and let's talk about, let's talk about uh, NP. So NP up here, that's our coefficient, right? And that's the same as, well, not the same, but it is, uh, it is uh, the same concept as our CP and SP, right? It's just the coefficient that tells us, you know, what we multiply our sines and cosines by. And this coefficient is equal to the integral over the function in the unit cell. So you have to know the function in the unit cell to get nx. And in order to get the value for p, we also have this x minus i 2 pi p over a here. And you can see this works because if we take and we substitute our definition of an x from here, and we substitute that into our equation, and I, I put a prime in front of the p because we have two p's here. So we have a, a p and a p prime, and they're different numbers. So if I substitute in uh, this and x, then I get this expression where I've got my sum over p prime because uh, this p prime is just an integer and it has no x in it. That means I can pull it out. Same thing, that 
NP prime, that's just a value, like right? number five, or right? in this case, it'd be, you know, five plus two I or whatever. It's just a number. There's no X value. So I can pull that out as well. I can pull out the one over A and that leaves me with this integral. And for that integral, when P is, whoops, when P is equal to P prime, then we get E to the zero, which is one, which gives me NP, right? Because we're integrating from zero to A. Anytime that I have P not equal to zero, then I get zero and one. So I get one minus one is equal to zero. So the only time when this integral works is when P is equal to P prime and that gives me NP. So that proves to us that NP is equal to NP. So that is evidence that uh, this is a valid relationship. And now that we have that, that means that if you know your charge density or whatever function, then you've got your NP. And because you have your NP and you know that you've got this sum, you can just plug things in and you can express any function purely in terms of what happens in that one unit cell. And that's, that's really great because it means that you now have a function and you know this function is true from minus infinity to uh, plus infinity, but you defined that entire range only in terms of the unit cell. And intuitively that makes sense to you, but this is a way that you actually have the mathematical language to be able to work with a function that goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, purely using that one repeat unit. Again, I said that the, the math here is something which for me, when I saw it the first time was really mind blowing because it meant that I had for the first time the ability to say, well, I know what happens in this region of space, therefore I know what happens out at infinity. Okay, so this is all in one dimensions. In three dimensions, it's exactly the same. However, now we have vectors. So generalizing this to 3D, we have N and now instead of X, we've got a vector R. So that's just some position in space, anywhere in space. We're now performing a sum. And instead of summing over P, we're going to sum over G. So this is the sum over a vector. And we're summing over every vector in this reciprocal lattice or every point in the reciprocal lattice. And again, we have our E to the I G dot R. And that is a dot product, right? So G is a, is a vector, R is a vector. You're taking the dot product of those. So that's our Fourier expansion and our Fourier coefficient. Here is again, the integral. So this is actually a triple integral. That is uh, integral dx, integral dy, integral dz, but it's over the unit cell, right? So you have to integrate this function, which presumably we know over the unit cell with our e to the minus i g dot r. And I want you to notice here that uh, this one has a plus, this one has a minus. So that's why these two are related to each other. They're related because their phase is exactly shifted by pi. Okay. And this is our, uh, Fourier coefficient. Uh, v cell, that's the, the volume of a cell defined by three vectors. Well, that comes from this triple product where you take the cross product and then take the dot product of the third vector and that cross product. That's just the definition of uh, a volume defined by three vectors. And now this is our, this is our reciprocal lattice. 
And I just define this as I, and this is the cross product of J and K. And I said, I, J, and K are cyclic. And by saying they're cyclic, what I mean is that we'll have a, right up here, B1 is equal to 2 pi over V, A2 cross A3. B2 is equal to 2 pi over V, A3 cross A1. B3 is equal to 2 pi over V, A1 cross A2, right? I cycled through 1, 2, and 3 to give us our uh, vectors. And also notice that it has units of one over length, right? Because that's volume, which is meters cubed, and it's being multiplied by meters squared. The same is true up here in one dimensional space too, is worth pointing out, right? Here's our, where's our one dimensional space? You're hiding here somewhere. Oh, wow. My eyes were bad, I didn't know they were that. Oh, there they are, here, right? 2 pi p over a, so this is 1 over meters. And that's why we call it a reciprocal lattice, because it's 1 over length. So our real lattice has units of length. Our reciprocal lattice has units of 1 over length. OK. Uh, it also has a special property that if I take b sub i and I dot it with ve lattice vector a sub j, I get 2 pi del ij. So this del ij, that's called the Kronegger delta. And that is equal to 1 if i equals j 0 otherwise. And you can see that proof here. So I took, I took a uh, uh, a1 dot b1, and that gives me bump, bump, and it turns into uh, zero. And if I take a3 dot b3, then I get two pi. Okay, so this is our reciprocal lattice vectors, and that means that our g is equal to an integer sum of those vectors. So V is an integer. So just the way our translation vectors in real space was an integer sum of the unit cell vectors, our reciprocal lattice vector is a integer sum of the reciprocal lattice vectors. So we can look at how this works, right? If I take n r plus t, and that's our definition, then I substitute in, uh, well, actually, I don't substitute in. I, I split this up, right? Bump, bump, bump. Well, when I split that up, I look at the definition of g dot t, and that gives me this which gives me 2 pi, which means I get i 2 pi n, n, which is an integer, which is going to be equal to 1. And this is, again, just nr. So using that definition of a uh, Fourier expansion and using that definition of a uh, the Fourier coefficients, uh, we're able to enforce the periodicity of the lattice, lattice. Okay, so that's that's enough of the math. Let's get to diffraction. This is how to think about diffraction in the most general possible way. In the most general possible way, we have a plane wave that's coming in. And the way that we write a plane wave is e to the i k dot r. Uh, k is the wave vector. 
it gives us the direction and it gives us the wavelength because the magnitude of k is 2 pi over lambda. So it's one, the wavelength. And then in here is our crystal. And there's a bunch of stuff in our crystal. Our crystal has a charge density. And that charge density, it spans the entire size of the crystal. Again, that's what makes this important is because now we can explain the charge density of the entire crystal using that single unit cell. And then somewhere out here, we have a plane wave coming out. And we don't know where it is, but we know that it's going to be defined by K prime. It's again, a plane wave. And that means e to the i k prime dot r. And we can ask ourselves, what's the amplitude of the whatever, the light, the electrons, the neutrons, the x-rays that scatter from this thing? And this is our scattering wave amplitude, f, and we have to integrate over the entire crystal. And it has in it this change in the wave, right? This delta k is k prime minus k because we've basically taken and we've changed the direction. And what we're going to do here is we're going to take our function, which is a function over the entire crystal, and we're going to replace it with our Fourier expansion. So we've got this sum over g, e to the i, g minus delta k dot r. OK. Now, what are the implications of this? Well, for most values of delta k, so remember, g doesn't change, right? g is a just a basically sum of all these possible lattice points. And you can't change g. But k can change, right? Because we could say, oh, it's coming up this way, or this way, or this way. We get to choose the delta k. And for most values of delta k, if we perform this sum, it goes away. But if we pick delta k is equal to some value of g. Remember, g is g is equal to v u, uh, sorry v1 plus v2, v2 plus v2, 3, v3. And I pick some set of uh, v values, and I'm going to call that you know, g1. Well, if delta k is exactly equal to any reciprocal lattice, then that summation goes to zero everywhere except g is equal to g1. And when g is equal to g1, they add to zero, which makes the exponent go to one, which means that our scattering factor is now non-zero. So the condition for diffraction is that the direction of diffraction when it is uh, sub subtracts the direction that the wave's coming in has to be equal to a reciprocal lattice vector. And it can be any reciprocal lattice vector. So what does this mean? Uh, and what are the implications? OK, let's, let's go back and talk a little bit more about G, because G has some, some special properties. For one, G is normal to the HKL plane. So remember, I was writing G as uh, uh, these Vs. Well, I could also write it this way. H K L is equal to H V one plus K V two plus H K L V three. So now H K L 
are my coefficients. They have to be integer, integers. And in Miller index notation, those are equal. Second property of G is that the spacing between the HTL planes is 2 pi divided by the magnitude of G. And here I worked through the derivations. Uh, I don't find this particularly interesting. It's good to know that it works, but uh, I'm going to skip that here. So just know that you've got it and you can look it up. It's going to be in the notes. So let's come back now to this idea of the Bragg construction, right? In the Bragg construction, we've got our planes, yada, yada, yada. We've got our incoming vector, which I'm going to translate down here. Because remember, you can take your vectors and you can pick up the tip and the tail and you can move them anywhere you want, right? So I've just taken my incoming vector and I've moved it so the tip is tied to the tip of my outgoing vector. And in the Bragg construction, Remember, we're forcing that to be in the theta to theta position. And that means that the only time that diffraction can occur is if this geometry holds. Okay, let's, 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 let's come back to that a, a little bit here. Uh, what do we know about these vectors? Well, one thing we know is we know that we have elastic scattering, which means the energy coming in and the energy going out have to be the same. And because the energy of an incoming wave is uh, h bar omega and omega is the speed of light times k, that means that k in and k out have to be the same length. That's one thing we know. Uh, another thing we know is that Delta K is equal to G, which means I can say K prime minus K is equal to G, which means K prime is equal to K plus G, which is what I have here. Now, we also know that I can take this picture and I can, I can cut it up as this, this triangle. And I know that's two theta, so I know this is theta, which means I have K one half G theta so I have sine 1 half g over k. If I multiply the left and the right by 2d, I get 2d sine theta is equal to 2d 1 half g over k. And we know that d is 1 half g, which means that 2d sine theta is equal to 2 pi over k, or sorry, is equal to uh, 2, 2 pi over g, 1 half g over k, 2 pi over k, when these things can't cancel out, gives us lambda. So 2d sine theta is equal to lambda, or we know that it can be n lambda because it just has to be some integer of lambda. Bragg's law. So Bragg's law falls out from this. But that's not the important thing. The important thing, and, and what you're going to be using this for in TEM, is that so-called Lowy diffraction. And you've, you've seen that before, right? You've seen that before, where you've got some you know, through beam, and then you got a bunch of spots around. And when you look at that, it doesn't make any sense. It, it really doesn't. Uh, until you start realizing that what you're actually looking at is you're looking at a map of the reciprocal lattice. And, and by that, I mean, this is how the A-vault a construction works. You've got some source, could be x-rays, could be electrons, whatever, some wave, it comes through, it strikes your crystal, you know the orientation of the crystal, and then you get a through beam that burns a big hole there, and then you get diffraction spots. And you'll see these when we get to TEM. And you say, well, okay, so where do those diffraction spots come from? Well, they come from having your crystal and you know
the orientation of the crystal because you put it there. And you know your incoming wave because you line the crystal up with your x-ray source. And if you know the incoming wave and you know the orientation, that means you know all of these uh, reciprocal lattice points, right? So this is, and you can define, say your zero, zero, zero point. Well, if you have the zero, zero, zero point, then you put the tip of your incoming wave at that. And then anywhere that you have a reciprocal lattice point that happens to fall on this circle, and it has to be on the circle, right? Because we know that K and K prime have the same length. They're just radius. So this is some sphere, actually. Anywhere that this sphere, which has radius 2 pi over lambda, where it cuts a reciprocal lattice point, you're going to have diffraction. So you're going to have some diffracted beam come out here. This is called the, the AVOL construction. It's just the mathematical way to think of what's happening. And, you know, the way I drew this, of course, you know, I've got a really big reciprocal lattice and a really small sphere. Uh, and, and that's because, uh, well, because I'm drawing this with a pen, right? Uh, truth of the matter is, the reciprocal lattice, the spacing is, is much smaller than the radius of the sphere. And as a result, you wind up with bunches and bunches of spots where the reciprocal lattice gets cut by that sphere and you wind up with diffraction that comes out. And if you think about a regular grid and a regular sphere, well, naturally you're gonna have symmetry. And that's why whenever you get these Lowry diffraction patterns, you always get something that winds up with, you know, the symmetry of the, of the crystal. I was going to draw a fivefold. What am I doing? Something that has the symmetry of the crystal. And we'll see this in TEM. But when you look at the picture in TEM and you look at this Lowry diffraction pattern, what I want you to think about is that what you're really what, what you're really seeing here is you're really seeing in this pattern a map of the reciprocal lattice. And actually, if you take an X-ray diffraction pattern and you take the inverse Fourier transform of it, you get the atomic spacing. So it's called a pair distribution function. It's saying how close are atoms to each other in real space. So you can take these diffraction images take the inverse Fourier transform and get information about the atomic positions in real space. So this this is something that I think is is uh, well for me it was really mind blowing what was happening, uh, and it made all the math a lot easier too. And again, vectors are your friends. Don't deal with geometry. Vectors are everything. Dot products, cross products, sine and cosine. That will do everything for you. Uh, there's another another construction, not just the uh, uh, AVOL construction called the, the Brillouin zone construction. That's very important if you're dealing with solid state physics and electronic structure. We're not going to talk about it here because it's not really relevant for characterization. Uh, okay, so kind of in summary, this is our condition for diffraction. It gives us the Bray construction, it gives us the AVOL construction, and it gives us the Brillouin zone construction. Uh, there are a you know, set of well-known reciprocal lattices. Again, you don't need to know this, but you should know that these do exist. Now, moving on, we're gonna go back and we're gonna look at this, this scattering amplitude. And those of you that have seen X-ray diffraction before, you know that there's diffraction, but all the peaks have different values, right? There's, there's never just a constant peak everywhere. And why does that happen? Well, that happens because the scattering amplitude not only depends on the lattice and the position of the atoms, 
but also on the charge near each atom. So, for example, atoms with large atomic numbers, gold, for example, they scatter x-rays much, much better than low atomic numbers. So if, for example, you're looking for, you know, hydrogen atoms that have embedded themselves in, you know, a gold lattice, you're never going to find a bi-x-ray diffraction. In fact, you probably won't find a by electron diffraction either. You will find them by neutron. Uh, and you'd be shocked at how much hydrogen's in everything. But uh, nonetheless, let's let's look at this scattering amplitude and how to break it down on a cell by cell and atom by atom basis. Okay, so here we've got our uh, uh, scattering amplitude, and let's only consider one particular g vector, right? So we're only going to look at one diffraction peak in our X-ray diffraction. Or, okay, so we're going to pick just one particular vector, and we know that g is a function of h, k, l. So we're going to look at one index plane, and we're going to call that fg. And if we do that, that means that we substitute in to our uh, electron diffraction uh, our g. I should say here, our delta k becomes g. So let's erase that. It's not our charge density, but it's actually our uh, direction. And this n is the number of cells in the crystal. So we're going to integrate just over one cell with one plane, and then we multiply it by the number of cells, because it makes sense that if you have more of a sample there, you're going to get more scattering, right? And if you do that, you wind up with Fg is equal to Nsg, where this is Sg, and N is just a prefactor. This Sg is called structure factor, and it is, again, just this integral. And again, the structure factor is the structure factor for a particular set of HKL plan, HKL. Now, within this cell, there are multiple atoms. So if we want to talk about the charge scattering from the atoms, and again, it's a little bit deceptive to do this because you say, well, which electron belongs to which atom and what if they're bonded? So I, I recognize that. Uh, but within the, uh, what I would call rudimentary diffraction analysis, we try to isolate which uh, electrons belong to which atoms. So if we can say that the total charge density in that unit cell is a sum of the charge densities from each atom, and let's say there are uh, S atoms in total, then I can substitute that in for ng, and we'll get this. So we've got a sum over s. And taking and, and breaking this up, what we find is that our structure factor has one term, which is the lattice. and one term, which is the atomic term. And you can go and look these up. So this I took out of uh, Cullody's textbook. And if you look at the table, uh, these are uh, angular relationships, and you can pick, you know, for example, you know, nitrogen, or you can pick, you know, nitrogen in the plus three state, oxygen, oxygen in the minus two state. And that will give you what gets substituted in, whoop, whoop, what gets substituted into F, 
which gets substituted into the structure factor, which then gets substituted into your uh, uh, scattering amplitude. So I, I want to give you two quick examples of, of how this structure factor can be applied. So the first example is the body center cubic crystal. Okay, body center cubic crystal, it has two atoms, one atom at the origin and the other atom in the center of the cell, right? One half, one half, one half. And let's just say they're the, the same atom just for the sake of argument. Well, if that's true, now our structure factor is going to have the sum, and our G will have that. Our uh, atomic position will be written as either 0, 0, 0, or 1 half, 1 half, 1 half. We take the dot product of those two, and we'll wind up with 2 pi. Uh, V1 X J V2 Y J V3 J Z J. And this is still J equals zero to two. Sorry, one to two, right? Because we have the two atoms. And if we write that sum out in the case where you're at the origin, Zero, zero, zero. Well, that gives you x to the zero, which is one. And in the case where you're at one half, one half, one half, well, then your two goes away and you're left with this. And I'm calling n just the sum of v1 plus v2 plus v3. Okay. Now, what's worth noting is that if n is odd, then this becomes minus one and SG becomes zero. If N, that sum, is even, then SG becomes plus one and SG becomes plus two. So what that means is it means that for a body center cubic, the sum of your HKL must be equal to even. So if you're looking at a diffraction pattern and you're trying to index the planes and you know that it's body centered, you just throw away any time when the sum of the HKL is odd. So here's a second example, FCC. Okay, FCC and I'm not stepping through all the steps here. I kind of jump to the end. And if you jump to the end, this is your structure factor. And what you find substituting in is that if V1, V2, V3 are all odd or all even, then you wind up with diffraction. If they aren't, then you don't. So the atomic basis is actually fairly important because the atomic basis will give you changes in the amplitudes and will give you uh, situations where, it, for example, you don't get any uh, diffraction. So that's uh, my lecture on diffraction.